One evening, they discovered that Turkir, the sudden man, was missing. Leif was deeply troubled, for Turkir had been with Leif and his father for many years and had been devoted to Leif when he was a child. Leif reprimanded his men and prepared twelve to mount a search. But after going just a short distance from the house, they were delighted to encounter Turkir. Leif saw at once that his foster father was in high spirits. Turkia was short, with small eyes, a sorry-looking individual altogether, but very capable. Leif asked him, Where have you been, wandering off and worrying us, foster father? Turkia answered in German, grinning, but then switched to the northern tongue. I did not go far, and yet I have found something. I found vines and grapes. Is this indeed true, foster father? asked Leif. Certainly it is true, he said for I was born where there was no lack of either grapes or vines. They slept the night through, and the next day Leif said to his shipmates, Each this day will gather grapes, or cut vines, or fell trees to fill my ship. They did as he said, and their afterboat was filled with grapes. A cargo sufficient for the ship was cut, and when the spring came, they made their ship ready and sailed away and from its products Leif gave the land a name, and called it Vinland, the saga of the Greenlanders. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, the history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. This is Season 1, The Forest, the Steppe, and the Birth of the Russian Empire, and Episode 25, Enter the Rus Part 2. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the story of Leif Erikson and the no longer controversial idea that the Vikings voyaged to America. But did you realize that Turkia, the man who discovered the grapes that caused Leif to name his discovery Vinland, a man described as short, with small eyes, has a name that is simply Norse for the Turk? Yes, it seems a man of the steppe was on that first voyage, and recognized the grapes which the northern Vikings may never have seen, because he grew up in the south, maybe in the Caucasus, maybe in Transoxiana, where people had been making wine for thousands of years. Many have noted a similarity between the Vikings and the people of the steppe. The Byzantines called them the Taurus Gideons, the northern Scythians. The Vikings have been called the nomads of the sea, and they composed poems referring to their ships as horses. In turn, the grassy expanses of the steppe have been compared to the ocean. Both societies were migratory, feared by sedentary peoples for their attacks and plundering, but also intimately involved in trade, bringing goods from thousands of kilometres away to new markets and linking cultures together into networks spreading across continents. Among the Rus, the Scandinavian elite were mobile in a way quite similar to the warrior elites of steppe societies like the Khazars and Bulgars. The trading expeditions made their long trips as full communities, bringing their women and children with them. As Rus grew, these summer commercial trips gained a winter counterpart, the Poluda, in which the warriors, often Varangians, would do the rounds of the subject peoples, collecting tribute and in-kind taxes that would then be used in the following season's trade. This mobility was recognised by contemporary observers, describing the 860 attack on Constantinople Patriarch Photius refers to the Rus as nomadicon, nomadic, 
Later, Constantine Porphyrogenitus wrote, quote, The severe manner of life of these Rus in wintertime is as follows. When the month of November begins, their chiefs, together with all the Rus, leave Kiev and go on the Poluda, visiting the Slavonic regions of the Vervians, Drugovicians, Kruvicians, Severians, and the rest of the Slavs who are tributaries of the Rus. There they are maintained throughout the winter, but starting from the month of April, when the ice of the Dnieper melts, they come back to Kiev, they collect their dugouts, fit them out, and then come down to Romania. End quote. From the settlement at Lanso Meadow in Newfoundland in the west, the Viking routes into the east, the Osterweger, or Eastern Road, reached as far as Central Asia. A gravestone in Vastmansland, Sweden, stands in honour of a man named Slagvi, who died in Karozum, which is the Norse rendering of Horazim, a medieval kingdom on the Amudarya, in what are now Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. The steppe was the intermediary between the Viking world of northern Europe and the Atlantic coast, and the Silk Road trade networks of Central Asia. How did they get along with each other? Did they themselves see any commonality? How many Turkias were there in the long ships of the West? And did any of the Vikings, the Varangians, who took service with steppe rulers, decide to stay and join their societies? We know that this did happen because genetic testing of remains shows that people with the haplogroups typical of the Black Sea region were living in Norway, while Scandinavian burials can be found as far away as the Caspian. But as with so much at this time, it is hard for us to really know about the lives of individuals with the scant evidence that we have. But we can reconstruct a fair bit about Scandinavian and Rus encounters on the steppe. Not of least importance for our story, we know that while the Scandinavians would make themselves a power in the forest, and then as they became the Rus, they would extend their power down through the Dnieper to the south. The steppe peoples, most prominently the Bulgars and the Khazars, would block them in the east, and the Volga would remain out of their reach. In this episode, we're going to look at the relations between the Scandinavians and early Rus and those eastern neighbours. <laughs> There was cultural exchange between Scandinavia and the steppe, beyond the trade in silver slaves and furs. You will recall the importance of belts as a status symbol among steppe peoples. Scandinavians took belt strap endings and fittings from the steppe, along with similar items for horse gear. These have been found across the Scandinavian world, from Sweden to Iceland. Over time, they were adapted to incorporate Scandinavian motifs and developed into their own tradition, similar to, but distinct from those on the steppe. Scholars no longer accept a division between the Western and Eastern Viking worlds. We know that Vikings travelled both ways. Turkir was not alone in his journey from the steppe to North America. The Stargas tell of Vikings who spent times as Varangians in Rus before returning to Scandinavia and raiding Britain. Genetic testing of remains from the Great Army that ravaged England between 865 and 878 showed that it included Bolts and Finno-Ugrians recruited from the east. They carried Cornelian beads, which, as we heard last time, reached Scandinavia from India through these eastern trade routes and archaeologists have found more traces of Scandinavian presence in Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine than they have anywhere in Western Europe. Some scholars even argue that the Viking Age began in Eastern Europe. Viking ship burials, most likely the aftermath of raids, found in Estonia, are at least half a century older than the first raids on England 
that have traditionally been taken as its starting point. Of course, by this point I think I have no need to explain the significance of the East Road for Scandinavia and Rustu anymore, but I would emphasise one more time that the early network was from the Baltic to the steppe, not through the steppe. Although the Slavs will eventually come to dominate Rus, the turn south towards the Dnieper comes after the contact with the Turkic peoples further east. As evidence continues to accumulate, some scholars argue for two Ruses, one around Kiev that is essentially Slavic, and one on the upper Volga, a looser, less centralised Rus, formed by Scandinavian Slavs and Turkic peoples with a strong steppe influence. We have already referenced the early Islamic texts describing the encounters between the Rus and steppe people, but there are a couple of notable points we have yet to bring out. One thing that stands out is that there is no evidence of surprise or shock at encountering an alien culture. It is very normal throughout history for one culture meeting another to find them strange and difficult to understand. One might think of the first Chinese travellers to the West, Herodotus' strange tales of Africa and India, European encounters with the civilizations of Asia and the Americas, and we have already heard plenty of times in this podcast about sedentary civilizations and their fear and inability to understand steppe nomads. In writings from the ancient Greeks to the medieval Europeans who faced the Mongols, the steppe peoples are constantly referred to as hideous, filthy, savage, cruel, deceitful, a barely human scourge on civilization. In the steppe commentary on sedentary peoples, which has been preserved, the steppe peoples regard city dwellers as weak, deceitful, lacking in honour and always acting only in their own interests. The two regard each other as alien and forever in opposition. But there is nothing of this in the descriptions of relationships between the Rus and the Bulgars or Khazars. They seem to have understood each other and got along perfectly well. So maybe the nomads of the steppe and the nomads of the sea really did recognise their similarity and find a certain level of things in common between them. Recent scholarship has overturned the previously long-held ideas of homogenous Scandinavian warbands and shown that the Rus success in integrating with the indigenous peoples of the eastern forests fitted well into the larger picture. Scandinavian leaders had their sworn retinues, called lith, but around that core they would add forced conscripts, mercenaries, and recruits from other ethnic groups. On their long-range campaigns, they would take craftsmen and artisans, and often women and children, along with them. So again, they resembled the confederated mobile societies of the steppe, that also moved en masse. Second, as I mentioned a moment ago, the initial Rus contact with the steppe largely ended on the borders of Khazaria. The Scandinavians were technologically advanced compared to all the inland peoples in terms of their shipbuilding, sailing and naval warfare skills. They were quite capable of travelling to the Caspian but they were only able to do so with Khazar permission and under Khazar control. The vast majority of trade with Central Asia went through Bulgar and Khazar intermediaries, rather than the Scandinavians travelling further themselves. And they did not establish their influence over the steppe in the same way they did in the forest zone and Slavic areas further west. For some, this created an impression that the Rus were under Khazar control, If we return for a minute to the Rus embassy sent to Louis de Pius once again, there are scholars who reject the idea that there was a Rus Khagan at all. They argue that the Rus who reached the south simply meant the Khazar Khagan, who as the controller of Rus trade was the overlord of the Rus. The Khazars and Bulgars were naturally well aware of the role trade played in generating their wealth and they exerted as much control over it as they could. 
including fortification and blockades on the waterways, and approval for subordinate tribes raiding overland raiders who did not have the Kagan's approval. Once they got past the Khazars, the Byzantines would have been a similar roadblock to extending the East Road through to the Mediterranean. The upshot of this was that, at least for the initial Rus period before they grew strong enough to challenge the status quo, hostilities in the East were more of a deviation from the norm and peaceful commercial relations generally prevailed. In this episode we are looking more at the trade in the Eastern part, particularly on the Volga, but keep in mind that there is an overlap with more westerly trade. Although we are discussing the East Road from the Baltic to the Islamic world a lot, that was not all there was, and as Rus developed and separated from Scandinavia, it was maybe not even most of what there was. The trade networks also connected directly from Bulga and Itil to Kiev, and through Kiev to Krakow, Prague and Regensburg which provided another forum where Scandinavian Rus merchants could meet their steppe counterparts. As I've already noted, the Scandinavian and Rus trade may have been overland to start with, but the river trade eventually came to dominate. We do not actually have a record of the routes that they used, so they have to be reconstructed from a combination of archaeological finds and just looking at the geography to see where a route might run, and then see whether there is evidence there to support it. So, from the Baltic, Scandinavians could follow the East Road through the Gulf of Finland, up the Neva and into Lake Ladoga, then the Volkov to Lake Ilmen, or they could go through the Gulf of Riga along the Daugava or Davina, and then the Lovat. From there, short portages and tributaries connected to the Dnieper or through Biela Ozera to the Volga. There is a general agreement among both contemporary sources and historians that these were very difficult routes. Climate is one obvious factor, with the rivers frozen in the winter and many smaller rivers further south drying out in the summer. You can imagine a crew travelling back north with their load of goods from Constantinople and finding that they had to drag their ship an extra 20 kilometres because the tributary they use on the southward journey in the spring is gone. Special boats were used to make the portage easier. They were lighter and capable of flexing to make it easier to pass obstacles. As we will see in the next episode, travel on the Dnieper was even harder. All this meant that Vikings travelling from, say, Ireland to Constantinople were more likely to take the Atlantic-Mediterranean route rather than going back through the Baltic and then south. In addition to these practical difficulties, travel on the East Road meant paying the road owner. All the steppe powers had used customs levies on merchants as a major source of revenue for centuries by this point and the Khazars and Volga Bulgars were no different. And then there were also Madias and Pechenegs to contend with. Rus merchants were always looking for alternative routes that would enable them to avoid the choke points with customs inspectors. According to Ibn Kuradibbih, the Scandinavians would also pretend to be Christians to avoid paying the Muslim tax on non-believers. The choice of route also depended on where you wanted to go. A merchant travelling to Ital through the Black Sea, which is a route that does not seem to have existed, would have risked double taxation from both Byzantines and Khazars. This made the Don, which Muslim writers refer to as the Rus River, the best route for avoiding the Byzantine-controlled Black Sea which was probably one of the reasons the Khazars built the Sarkel fortress to control the Don. Sarkel could be bypassed by following the Donets, where there have been numerous Rus finds, but the Khazars seem to have developed an extensive network of fortresses to control the waterways. With 25 sites built between the 8th and 10th centuries so far identified by archaeologists, As we've mentioned in previous episodes, there was an interruption in the silver reaching the Baltic through the Khazars around the end of the 9th century. 
sometimes called a silver crisis, the reasons are still not clear. There may have been a succession struggle or a civil war in Khazaria, possibly related to the conversion to Judaism. But whatever happened, when the flow restarted, it was coming from Samanid Persia rather than the Abbasid Caliphate. That is, it was crossing the steppe from Khorasan to Bulgar. While previously, Scandinavian and Rus merchants had had to travel down to Ital and sometimes be allowed to sail across the Caspian and take a camel train to Baghdad itself, now all they had to do was travel to the marketplace in Bulgar, a much faster and less risky proposition. All that was needed was for their counterparties to also want to travel to the Middle Volga, and it seems that they did. This transition had a massive long-term impact, with the Khazars eventually losing over 80% of the tax revenue that had paid for their standing armies to the Volga Bulgars. The Rus merchants, who had made the journey to Baghdad, were described as selling beaver and fox pelts, as well as swords. They were known to trade in Frankish swords, straight, two-edged, which was an illicit trade as the Franks had banned the sale of their swords eastwards. Itil was also known to have a large fur market, which the Scandinavians and Rus supplied, but they would not have had much interest in the swords. Although the swords are mentioned in the tale of bygone years, where the Khazars allegedly refused tribute paid by the Slavs and two-edged swords, which is taken to be implying that the Slavs were becoming stronger than their Khazar masters because their swords were sharp on both sides, instead of just one in the steppe style. The sabre is a superior style for the mounted warrior, and there's no archaeological evidence for the adoption of straight two-edged blades anywhere in the Pontic steppe. Other than furs, the main commodity the Rus sold to the Khazars was slaves, and this continued in Bulgar. I'll be looking at the northern slave trade in more detail in an upcoming episode. Records in Khwarezm show that they purchased squirrel, ermine, mink, fox, martin, beaver and hair pelts, wax, narwhal and walrus tusks, honey, amber and swords from Bulgar, and exported back beads, glass, amber, ceramics, coral, amethyst, jasper, silk, clothing and decorative fittings. Although Viking ships were known to transport animals, the only trade in Bulgar seems to have been to provide victims for sacrifices. Arab writers describe the Rus slaughtering sheep, cattle, horses, a dog, a rooster and a hen when burying a chieftain who died at Bulgar. It is noteworthy that even if the Scandinavians were travelling to Bulgar to trade alongside the Rus, none of the goods referenced are from Scandinavia. The best pelts came from the northern forests, tusks from the far north. Honey and wax were produced by the Finno-Ugrians in the forest steppe belt. Amber came from the eastern shores of the Baltic, and the slaves were Finns, Balts and Slavs. For their part, besides levying taxes, the Khazars and Bulgars also provided services. Caravanserai, large buildings arranged around a courtyard that provided food and shelter to travellers and their animals, have been found at Bulgar, Sarkel and Biliar, as well as warehouses for storing goods. In Itil, the various trading nations were assigned their quarters in the city, and in Bulgar, the Rus were given land to build large wooden houses. Contemporary writers reported that the Bulgar were friendly and welcoming, offering gifts to encourage long-term business relationships and feasting merchants in their own homes, although they could quickly switch their mood if someone did not pay. So if the Scandinavians and Rus were such a good match for the Turkic peoples of the steppe, why did they turn south towards the Slavs rather than carrying on into the Volga region and further east towards their Islamic trading partners? <laughs> 
Well, as we've already seen in previous episodes, at the time the Bulgars migrated into the middle Volga to establish Volga Bulgaria, and other steppe groups under the Khazars were turning to a sedentary lifestyle on the western and northern edges of the steppe, their level of development was higher than that of the Slavs. Metalworking and farming was more advanced in the forest steppe belt of the Middle Volga and cis region than it was further west in the Slavic areas. The Bulgars also brought their characteristic organisational structure of the steppe with them into Bulgaria. This meant especially that they were far and away the greatest military power in the region. In the early Rus period we are looking at, 750 to 900, only a northern campaign by the Khazars could have challenged them, but certainly not any of the Finno-Ugrian peoples around them, and not the Rus. In 913, the Rus took a fleet of 500 ships to raid the southern shore of the Caspian Sea, buying safe passage from the Khazars by promising them half of the booty. The raid was a success. They rampaged around the coast, plundering and taking slaves. But when the Kagan's Muslim subjects heard, they were outraged. The Kagan was forced to withdraw his protection, and the returning Rus expedition was cornered and annihilated by the Bulgars. The Bulgars had a substantial population, which soon extended to include neighbouring Finno-Ugrian peoples in the region along with the whole confederation that had migrated northwards. They preserved the ritualized nomadism found among the Khazars, but had already established substantial cities at Volga and Suvar. They were building increasingly developed fortifications, and one of the reasons Ibn Fadlan was visiting was a request from the Khan for Islamic engineers to be sent to work on stone fortifications. Islam had already reached the Bulgars by the 9th century, which was another link to the wider world to the south, beyond the ancient connections to the steppe. It also began to serve as a unifying factor in their identity, combined with the well-established clan structures and steppe-style hierarchical relationships that they brought with them to Middle Volga. They had a centralised financial system, with the Khan receiving his share of any raiding plunder or war booty, as well as the tithe levied on traders. As the trade with the Rus and Scandinavians developed, the Khan increasingly resented having to pay his own tribute on to the Khan in Itil, and the tendency towards Bulgar independence grew. Altogether, we can clearly see that Volga Bulgaria was an emerging state, rather than a tribal or village society. So the opportunities for a foreign elite to come in and put themselves in charge through greater military prowess and access to goods or money, which is what the Rus found in the south and further west, were just not there on the Volga. Although retrospectively we know that the Khazars were reaching the twilight of their empire as the Rus developed, with their hold on the steppe to the east and over subject peoples like the Bulgars, Magyars and Pechenegs becoming increasingly shaky. In the early Rus period, they were still completely dominant. There was no way for the Rus to enter Khazaria other than on Khazaria's terms. And the Khazars took steps to maintain this dominance, building fortresses to control the trade routes and attempting to reinforce their sovereignty over their vassals. This meant that there was simply no scope for the Rus to continue their eastwards expansion. Instead, they turned south. Despite appearing less promising at first glance, the Dnieper rapids made it a far worse proposition as a trade route than the Volga or the Don, and the vulnerability of proximity to the steppe made the southern cities far less defensible than those in the forest. This move would trigger a massive leap forward. Join me next episode as the Rus come to Kyiv. Each episode has an accompanying blog post where you can find maps, images of things we discuss, and sources. You can find them through the link in the show notes or on the website at the Russian Empire History Podcast.com. You can get in touch with me via the website, Twitter, or Facebook, or by email to hello at the Russian Empire History Podcast.com.
don't forget to check out the resources page on the website for links to further reading and the books of podcast guests. They are all books well worth your time, and buying off those links is another way to support the podcast. Thank you for listening. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you.